Hey everyone and welcome back to another episode of Our MFC. I am joined by a special guest today, Gabriel from the EFL Fan Show. Uh, how's it going, Gabriel? How are you doing? I'm um, great, thanks, Jordan. Uh, real pleasure to be on first time for Our MFC. I'm not a clear Middlesbrough fan myself, so a bit of an outsider coming in. I actually support Birmingham, but, um, but no, real pleasure to be on. No, honestly, mate, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you. I know we were meant to do something on, on Sunday, but just with timings and things, we couldn't kind of work something out. Um, so it's kind of, it was really good to have you on afterwards and we'll do like um, like a review kind of of the match. Sure. Um, so I've got some, some notes here, just to, like I wrote them down during the game and mm. had some thoughts after the game just of um, kind of how it went. I mean, I, I'm not sure if you got to see any of that match. I know, like you say... You no, know, no, I, I did watch the match, yeah. You did watch the match, yeah. Brilliant. Um, so, first of all, I thought, to be fair, tactically, I thought we started the better team. I think, obviously, going into that game, you know, Fulham of a really strong side, just came back down from the Premier League, got an unbelievable squad <laughs> with a good manager as well. I thought, you know... Tactically, you could see what we were going to do, how Warnock kind of wanted to set us up. We wanted to frustrate them, get in the faces a little bit, not let them have, you know, a lot of possession. Um, mm. I know, like I said, I thought like we started really well. Yeah. Um, I think that it's certainly a valuable point for, for Barrett. Um, I, I think that um, in terms of performance, you've always got to be a little bit careful in terms of reviewing opening day games because you don't know what the opposing team will go on to do and um, like you said there Fulham are a very strong side and personally I expect them to go on and um, secure automatic promotion I think they'll win the league as well um, and that opinion hasn't changed after the game even though they got points and things went away, away from them a little bit towards the end which I think is really credit to yourselves in terms of um, it was a little bit out of the blue wasn't it the equaliser but then from there you were the side that were putting on all the pressure. And I think that's almost the hallmark of a Neil Warnock side. You know, um, you might not necessarily be great for certain portions of games, but if you get a little bit of fortune, a little bit of a little bit of a rub of the green or one moment of clinical finishing, and there's something in a game for you, you'll, you'll take it. And I think that's that testament to the spirit that you showed in those closing stages. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, like, like I said, Fulham... I, I completely agree with you, and I know Warnock said after the game, you know, all you've got to do is take, and it doesn't necessarily mean if you've got a, a good team on paper that they're going to go on and, you know, mm. have that success, but looking at that team, and, you know, I'm sure when things start to click for them in terms of what Marco Silva's trying to do there as well, I think they will kick on from that point, and they'll probably, you know, kind of open up a little bit of a gap. I do expect them to kind of do something a little bit similar to like Norwich last season because I know Norwich um, they didn't actually take too well to begin with last season mm. um, coming back down to the championship but then after that they kind of steady themselves out and then from then on they just kick on and I think that's going to be something similar to Fulham this season. Yeah absolutely well I mean Jordan I don't know if you've ever seen the film um, uh, not the film the programme Catchphrase with um uh, Roy Walker or Ray Walker, who used to present yeah, yeah. it, and uh, you know, I always feel like with opening day games, to, to make a judgment about how a team's going to do based on an opening day would be a bit like guessing what the um, what the phrase is with just one square yeah, being yeah, open, yeah, yeah. sort of thing. So yeah. you know, you've got to you've got to give it a lot of time to kind of wait how things uh, things unfold. But I think that to get a point at Fulham is a really good result. And yeah. um, substitutions, I think, really work. I think having Jed Spence and um, Jordan, I think, was a left-sided player. Yeah. Having threat out wide of having a meant that Fulham were a little bit scared of playing a game that worked so well for them previously. And you have that transition. And Jones especially, um, I was really taken by his impact. Yeah, no. I mean, I've spoke to plenty of Borough fans um, there's a couple of other points I'll touch on, but yeah, mm. Jones was absolutely phenomenal when he came on. And I think what shocked a lot of us is because obviously we haven't seen that from him. Obviously, he's, yeah. a, younger, he's a younger player. We know of his talent in the under under twenty three side just from how it's been sporting about. 
He went out on loan to Queen of the South. Mm. Um, he had a really good season there, picking up quite a few goals and a couple of assists. Um, and then I know he had an injury. So if it wasn't for that injury, he'd probably gone out to have an even, even better season. But, you know, Warnock, after the game, spoke really highly of him and said, you know, he's, he's um, a young player, but they were kind of like taken aback by him because he was so... Mm. Um, so direct and but he, he's very calm and humble as well. So Warnock just said to him, "Look, forget forget the cameras, forget you know you're on live TV. Go out there, play football." And you know he did that, and he he made he made an impact. He gave us something different, didn't he, going forwards? Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, I think because there was an the initial substitution was bringing off uh, Iatsu and yeah. putting on uh, Devern, um, Marcus Devernier, who kind of, we kind of meant Matt Brooks went up top. And I think there was a period between that moment and Jones coming on where, you know, there wasn't enough engagement. I didn't feel like Crooks provided enough. But it felt like once Jones came on and you had him and Spence on either side, as I, as I touched on earlier, you've got a threat in transition on either flank. So what Fulham had done for much of the first sort of um, 70 minutes of that game was um, a lot of it was actually passing between uh, Tim Ream and, uh, and Tosin Adara Biao, who were their centre-backs, especially in that second half where, I mean, I think in the early stages of the second half, they had something crazy like 81% possession. Yeah. And, um, and I don't think that there was really that engagement from middle. But when a lot of managers, I think, would have probably gone to try and chase the game a little bit earlier and possibly that got picked off. But Neil Warnock was quite patient and he felt like he wanted to keep the margin of deficit quite low. Uh, well, well, low to, to one goal, really, as low as possible. And then he went for it in the last 20 minutes where you've got Jones, you've got Spence on either side, you've got that transition threat, you've got a bit of the press. And... Um, and what I love about it, about Jones as well is he's um you know there was one move where he set up a chance, I can't quite remember who it was for, but he showed incredible pace and just get down the flank over a long distance. But then when setting up Mark Bowler's equaliser, he showed quick feet as well. So it's not just those long distance runs, it was also that agility of his feet as well. Yeah. So he's someone on, on short evidence, it's only 90 minutes we've seen of him. But so far, it looked like he could be a really big player for you this season if he can keep that up. Yeah, well, I know um, Warnock spoke about, well, we play Blackpool tomorrow in the Cup. Mm. Um, and I know he's on about having um, a bit of a reshuffle. So I'm hoping, you know, it, the likes of him, we've got another youngster as well that impressed in pre-season, Jeremy Sivy, um, mm. who got a, a goal himself. Um, I'm hoping, you know, these kind of players can... Goal that, I mean, I know there's 1,300 um, fans travelling to Blackpool tomorrow. So right. hopefully, you know, they can get behind them and kind of these, these young lads can come in and show these fans exactly what they're about and kind of give Warnock something to think about because I know we are very thin on mm. squad depth especially. Um, yeah. I know we, we've signed a couple... Uh, well, we signed um, Luke Daniels and Sol Bamba today. And I know, but we're looking for a striker and a winger. So if, you know, the likes of these younger players can kind of turn Warnock's head and, you know, he's thinking, can I involve these players a bit more? It means we don't have to spend as much money then, you know, to, to win-win, really. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what what interests me is um, you had this period a couple of seasons ago where you got you wanted to go away from the Pulis regime, which I can understand, and um, you, you kind of appointed Jonathan Woodgate, and the whole idea was I think Woodgate had been slightly involved in the under twenty three, so the idea was promoting youth, and um, at that particular moment, Woodgate. You know, given a fair amount of time, didn't quite deliver the results you're hoping for. But um, I think under Neil Warner, we've maybe seen signs that he is, as well as having that nice where he's won um, eight, nine promotions in his career, which obviously helps. But he's willing to promote players like uh, like Jones to um, from the academy and you know put a few players like that in. Um, there's Josh Coburn, of course, made the bench. Um, Jed Spence, I suppose you'd say, was established under under Woodgate, but. Um, yeah, it feels like young players take a fair portion of, of our squad at the moment. Yeah, no, and it is. It's it's brilliant to see, and like you said, the the kind of shock of the opposition as well, because they don't really know much about these players. I think 
when mm. sometimes a squad has got like a set start and eleven, you can kind of plan, can't you, for these types of players? Yeah. You kind of know what they're about. Whereas when you know it's a player that's come off the bench, you don't know anything about. You don't know what they have to offer. You could stick a defender on that's meant to be defending a certain player, but then you bring a sub on against that defender who's completely different, and then bang, you know, he's out the game. Mm. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, but no, I was when you talk about the subs and things like that. I was really um, well. We like I say, we know what War looks like, but it was just that tactical, um, that tactical noose really. Because I, I thought even when hmm. Fulham had a lot of possession, um, you know they didn't necessarily do a lot with it. I know they had, um, in fairness to them, they had a lot more shots than us, and they did test Lumley a couple of times. Um, and he, to be fair, he was really good on his debut as well. Made a couple of saves, looked quite commanding. Um, but he, he wasn't mm. tested to the point where he was like overstretching for things, or do you know what I mean? It yeah. wasn't that that real that real test. And I thought we dug in deep and kind of just absorbed that pressure a little bit. Yeah, I think maybe what worked in Middlesbrough's favour was that someone like Alexander Mitrovic, who uh, at times in the championship, can be this real ruthless goal-scoring presence. Uh, probably wasn't as sharp as he was hoping to be today. And um, they, they've also maybe got some issues in the defensive midfield role, I would say, for them, because they started at Tyrese Francois, who I don't think, you know, some people liked what he produced from, from the Fulham perspective. But um, I still feel like Fulham were missing a kind of competitive um, holding midfielder, which I think a lot of people are hoping Harrison Reed can be when he comes back. Bit. So perhaps the timing worked a little bit for, for Middlesbrough, and maybe in a couple of weeks when Mitrovic is up to sharpness and uh, Fulham have got a Harrison Reed back fit, it might be a slightly different story, and perhaps they might have been able to take the game away from you a little bit. Um, but again, you listen, you, you hung on in there. And um, and certainly got a very good a very good point. Yeah, definitely. I think you know when you see a, a big team that you you know playing first game of the season, you're a little bit like, ooh, don't know how I feel about that. But to be fair, like I say, looking at it, especially afterward after the game, it probably was the best time to play them. Like you you know you mentioned there, they had quite a few players missing um, that mm. probably could have caused us some real harm. Um, but yeah, like I say, I'm happy with a point. I think every Borough fan is, to be fair. Um, the only couple of things that I was a, a little bit disappointed was, especially in that first half, was mm. when we did offer you know Fulham quite large portions of possession. I would have liked to have seen us when we eventually you know regained the ball to kind of maybe keep it a little bit better. I think at times the game got a little bit scrappy. Um, I think. Mm. Ik Piezu did, he did really well considering, you know, there wasn't, I'd like to have seen yeah. us like kind of keep on the floor a bit more and play into his feet and maybe have these other players kind of peeling off him. Um, because like I say, I think it was a little bit scrappy, you know, it was in the air a little bit and yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, I think it's difficult um, based on, to, to try and stop them the, the way they played because some of their moves were very fluent and I think that sort of took a lot out of, of Middlesbrough. Um, I mean, yeah, I think you look at players like um, Yatsu, I thought he, I'd probably agree with you, he battled well. I also thought Howson and Morsi put in yeah. uh, a good shift. But, um, but yeah, I can see your point that maybe using the ball uh, a little bit better might have, might have worked. Um, I um I suppose what's interesting to me is maybe you could have done with more of an outlet down that right hand side because you look at uh, Anthony Dykes deal. I think for me I feel like and I'd be really interested, Jordan, get your views on this. I feel like he's probably best uh, on the right of a back three um, rather than actually pushing forward loads. I don't know how Borough fans sort of see his last position. Yeah, no, I think um, when it comes to Jake Steele, he is. Because uh, I wouldn't say he's more, he's not really an attacking outlet. You know, I'd, I'd much rather have someone, if you were going to play wing back and go play that attacking 
style of football, I'd rather have someone like Jed Spence there. And I, mm. the, I think the, the issue Warnock sometimes has is when, you know, and Jed Spence, he's really good at attacking, but not as good as defending. Whereas Jake Steele, yeah. you know, he, he's, he's a well-rounded player. He can mm. offer you that attacking like style of play, that side of things, but he's really good defensively. Um, and to be fair, I think that's why um, Warnock brought in the likes of Darnell Fisher. Um, yeah. I think Fisher was the perfect replacement. You know, not a lot of money spent on him from Preston. Really good player. Really unfortunate with the injury. Um, and I, I, I genuinely think as well, if Fisher was fit, had no problems at all, I think we would have potentially even offloaded Jed Spence. Um, just because I know that there was a lot of there was a couple of teams from the Premier League that were interested, and mm. it could have potentially you know freed up some cash for like other other areas of the the field such as you know forwards. Um, but but yeah, I'd, I'd, yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. Ju- just to kind of uh, add to that, um, because it felt like under Jonathan Woodgate, Jed Bent was quite a regular starter, whereas under Neil Warnock, it feels like he's been more of a squad player. And uh, yeah, do you, do you think Middlesbrough fans would like to see Warnock use Jed Bent a little bit more and maybe go with wing backs with like Steele on the right of the three and then spent maybe as the wing back option? Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to Jed, you know, like I said, when we first seen him burst onto the scene under Woodgate, we were all taken back. But it was amazing to see as well because one thing we've got a reputation for, a decent reputation for, is bringing youth players through. Um, mm. And I think seeing that, it was everything that we wanted from Woodgate. Like you say, we were promised to bring the youth yeah. through and that kind of thing. Um, so it was amazing to see. And he... Like I say, he was, to be fair, one of our most consistent players under Woodgate. But then when Warnock came in, I don't know what had had happened. There just seemed to be this transition and Jed wasn't consistent at all. And I think a lot of fans trust Warnock. You know, we have faith in his yeah. kind of judgment. And if mm. he's not showing that consistency or he's not sure on him, then yeah. I think we'd trust him enough to kind of go, right, okay, fair enough. You know, if it's yeah. not the player for you, then that's fine. We kind of like accept that. I mean, I would love to see us use Jed, but if mm. he's not the right player for the team, then by all means, you know, it's... it's yeah, it's an interesting career. one. I mean, you've signed Lee Peltier, I think, in the summer. And if I'm not mistaken, Peltier has played under Warnock at the clubs, possibly QPR, certainly Cardiff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and he's probably a bit more in the dyke steel mould where he's just very solid and he's someone you can rely on defensively. And it feels to me as that as though that's what Warnock likes from his um his full back seat. He wants them to be strong in the challenge, disciplined defensively, and have that to, to add to the solidity. And um it, well, I suppose what's interesting is that I would have thought of Matt Bowler as being a very attacking left back or left wing back, but it feels like he's kept his place in in Warnock's first eleven plans because he's got that ability to put a challenge in, like he did it on on Harry Wilson, I guess, um, in that first half at uh, Craven Cottage. Yeah, I think well, every Borough fan we absolutely love Matt Bowler, like he. Matt Bowler's it's Matt Bowler. Do you know what I mean? It, it was well I personally I love stories like his because you know he, he he first came to the club, he was playing at Blackpool, um and you know he, he had a really good season there. Um and he was one that came through the Arsenal youth team. He's still very young. Um but he it that first season under yeah. it, you know it didn't go really well for him. You know, he wasn't very consistent. His touch was sluggish. He was off. Went on loan, came back in pre-season. And, you know, Warnock took one look at him, genuinely took one look at him and thought, this player's going to be gone Like with next week. He'll be gone. I, he literally looked at him and was like, how are you at this club? Didn't make sense. But he, he worked his ass off, you know, he... And he, he got himself in that team and just wanted to prove his manager wrong. Um, yeah. And 
last season, I think he was up there with one of the players that had played pretty much all the games. Um, and it was it's just amazing to see. And like you say, we can't for him to get that goal as well, considering it was you know it was one lapse of his concentration that went that caused their goal. So for him yeah. to get the equaliser to go and celebrate with all the fans, it was just amazing to see. And yeah, we all love Mark Bowler. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's uh, it's interesting actually because um, he uh, I think he got released by Arsenal and then um, he was really good a couple of years ago. I think for Blackpool in League One. And I certainly think he's deserved his chance in the Championship and uh, and kind of taken it. But um, one player I'd love to kind of um, talk about is Piero because he seems to have some brilliant reviews from his time in in Argentina and. Um, it feels like Burr last season established quite a you know a core of you know solid hard working players who who might be tidy on the ball like Dyke Steele, Morsi, McNair, um, maybe even Dale Fry when he's fit. But um, it feels like Piero is just going to inject that bit of uh, individual creativity, which which could go a long way. Yeah, I think to be fair, I think this whole summer. I think our business has been absolutely brilliant and, you know, it's not finished yet. I think this could genuinely be one of our best transfer windows in a God, like I can't even remember the last time we had a, I can say we've had a good transfer window and I think if we can mm. add a few more, it'd be, we'd top it off. But bringing someone like Martin Payero in, I remember, I think I was on my way to work I'd, and I'd, I'd seen, you know, I've got notifications on and things. And I'd seen that we were we were linked. Oh no, it was late at night or something. Sorry. So I'd seen it when I got up the next morning. Yeah. Um, and you kind of see it, and you don't. You go, oh, it'll just be. You know, it's just a rumor. You know, we our mm. club we get linked with bloody. We get linked with everyone. It didn't <laughs> surprise us anymore. Um, but then when things started to develop, and you know, Argentinian press are talking about him. Mm. I know that there's a, there's an account I follow on Twitter that follows. Argentinian football like Boca Juniors and teams like that and they said it genuinely like baffled them how we managed to sign him because he's such a highly rated player over there I think he was right. voted like Argentinian um like I think he was young player of the year it was it was along them lines. in their league or something. in their league yeah. or something yeah. Uh, yeah and he is touted to be like the next you know big thing essentially it was over there and reportedly we Inter Milan was supposedly interested uh, Athletic, mm. Atletico Madrid yeah um so we'd fended off you know this competition for a player that we didn't really know much about but we'd had you know so much um so many good reviews and things like that about him so much good press and I think mm. like I say Warnock's brought him in he spoke about him since we got back um and said that he's going to be that that player. There's a few players in there that are similar to him, but he's the one that's going to like unlock that door. And you know, we haven't had that final final cutting edge, and he's the yeah. one that's going to supposedly bring that. So and and just out of add to that, I remember um, Neil Warnock's QPR side that went promotion from this level in ten at eleven, and you kind of looked through it and you saw lots of committed, dedicated pros with great leadership qualities like Sean Derry and like Clint Hill. But then they had Adele Tirat, who was that one player who just, you know, would receive the ball and you didn't know what he was going to do with it and brought that excitement factor. And there's no reason why Piero can't have a similar impact at Burrow, I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm trying to, keep, like, I'm very, um, I'm a very hopeful person. Um, and I'm, it's not always a good quality because you can be faithful and, you know, this, that and the other. And some, we seem to mess it up somehow. <laughs> always happens to us. Um, but I think, like I said, Piero is a really good sign. And I think we've the fans have kind of got to not put too much pressure on him because, you know, he's, he's come to a new country straight after the Oops. Olympics as well. He played for Argentina in the Olympics. Um, he's... He doesn't speak a word of English, so I can only imagine what Neil Warnock's saying to him. You know, trying to understand Neil Warnock of all. Hopefully, they've got an app that allows you to translate well, 
Yeah, yeah, Neil Warnock said he said that they've got an app and it he puts it into his phone and it reads it out in like Spanish or something, and mm. he he was like, oh my god, it's a revelation. Um, yeah. But you know, you'll have seen the, the videos of Neil Warnock going, "Oh, you've got to die to get three points," and this, that, and the other. <laughs> so you can imagine him playing stuff like that to this lad who, you know, he's he said the the one downside to bringing in South American players is they won't get his jokes, and I absolutely love that. It's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, dear. Yeah, but um, no, I think I think in all honesty, like you say, when you compare him to Turat, I think. To be fair, when you look at his QPR side, and even his Cardiff side, his mm. Cardiff side didn't quite have a Tarat, but it was it's always a well balanced side. You know, like yeah, say you've got your key players. I think for us, the business that he's done for us has been superb in the sense of we haven't really had a leader since um, Grant Ledbetter, and for me one of the best bits of business he did last year was bringing in Sam Marcy. I think Sam Marcy is a definite future captain for this club. Um, I love his honesty and his, his fight. You know, it's everything that our fans kind of want in a player. Yeah. Um, and then bringing in the likes of Grant Hall, experienced player. I think Matt mm. Brooks is going to be another one that's a little bit underrated. Um, and then Sol Bamba as like a player coach role yeah. today. That's I think... going to be key. Yeah, definitely. I think with Saul Bamba, um, I, I, I can certainly see the appeal with Simon because A, he's a brilliant character who can, who's a, a leader of people. Um, and I think that's massive, especially in a Warnock side. He, he knows Warnock and responds well to his style of leadership. Um, and he's very fit, he's got that physicality as well and will dominate his box if crosses are coming in. I think what I would say is that Sol Bamba's arrival does point to maybe using a, a three at the back because, in my opinion, Sol Bamba would be much easier getting dragged into wide areas, which I think if you're playing a, a centre-back back four, you've got to be comfortable in wide areas because there's always that risk of the full-back getting caught too high up. I think you know, if you're playing in the middle of a back three, then you can pair yourself with, you can have players like Adele Fry or like a, um, yeah. a Dyke Steel who are comfortable in those wide areas that give you that protection. Um, so that's going to be really important to me. If he's playing in the middle of a back three, I still think he could be good at this level, but it's got to be the right system. Yeah, no, I agree. I completely agree with you there. And I think his arrival is kind of going to be, I think everyone knows it's kind of like, a backup for Fry and Hall. Mm. Um, and I think he, he's just one of them players that's going to come in when Warnock needs him. He knows he can rely on him. He knows he can do a job. But also, you know, he's here earning his coaching badges. Um, mm. He's, you know, passing on that experience to the younger academy lads. And yeah. we've kind of got a reputation of bringing, you know, fairly decent centre-backs through as well. So I could only mm. imagine, you know, it's going to be like bringing through centre backs, but on steroids. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's you know the experience he's got. I mean, the man fought cancer less than a year ago, and he's got himself a a new one year deal at a professional football club. Like he's an absolute inspiration. So you know, them academy lads can take a lot from this 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 man that's got a wealth of of knowledge in football. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that looking at the types of characters that you recruit can be quite an, an important thing and um, because you want to create the right sort of working culture and having someone like Bamba who's such an, an enthusiastic guy who can kind of will kind of rub off on other people and he can inspire those around him as well, I can definitely see why he's coming in. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I think... I think that that's pretty much everything. For, unless there's anything that you've got to kind of go through or you want to chat about, then... Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to chat to you actually about it, about Uke Yatsu, because um, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's someone who... Um, I, uh, I thought I had a really good year uh, last season at Wickham because it, it, I think you've got to do quite well if uh, to find at championship level someone that's got the, the standard height and physicality of your average target man, but that's also reasonably mobile, pretty athletic, 
and have pieces of individual quality. I mean, you're looking at someone like Kiefer Moore, who's pretty unique, I think, at championship level, maybe Lucas Shire to an extent. I think Piazza is probably the best player domestically Middlesbrough could have got for that sort of role. And, you know, I think, you know, maybe he played better football than we would maybe naturally associate with Neil Warnock's side. He did keep it on the deck at certain times last season, but it's always used to fall that at that in a side that's competing for the playoffs rather than battling yeah, what a Piazzo can do because um, yeah I'm, I'm really excited about him yeah no it's it's interesting you mentioned Kiefer Moore as well because you know before well I think it was the start of it was the start of last season um, when obviously it was announced that he was going to be kept on for the year one of his main targets was Kiefer Moore before he went to Cardiff Mm. Um, just because he's a he's a proper Warnock striker, but like you say, when it comes to um, strikers, like you say, they don't come thick and fast these days, do they? And you know, Uche, I think it's a little bit underrated in terms of what he has to offer, because mm. you know I've seen what he did at Hearts and the way that they you know sing his praises. Um, and I thought he would have had a, a bigger move, to be fair, considering his age then. But he, you know, he came to Wickham and wanted to prove himself at championship level. Mm. Um, I thought, you know, he spoke very highly of Gareth Ainsworth and, you know, how he kind of provided him with that chance. And to be fair, you know, in a Wickham side that, you know, lacked that kind of creativity and goals I think he got something like it was only six or seven goals in that season yeah. but like you say when he's put in a team where fingers crossed this season there's going to be a lot more creativity like you say the likes of Tavernier behind him mm. Piero, Crooks, yeah. um, Jones if he steps up as well um, you know hopefully we can get balls in the box get to his feet as well and he can kind of um, prove himself and that I love, I've spoke about this previously, not only is he a good, like, Warnock signer, I think he's good for the fans as well. He's only, he's 26, but he wants to come here and he has something to prove. Yeah. Whereas a lot of strikers that you sign nowadays, you know, they, they're coming on, on like a decent amount of money and they kind of know yeah. that they're already good players. Um, yeah, I mean, we forked out a lot of money for these players and yeah. they already knew that they were really good players. And I'm not saying Uche doesn't know he's a good player because he, he, he will know he's a good player, but he has that little bit of that extra to prove mm -hmm. and to go, you know what, I'm going to stamp my name. I, you know, I want to write history for this club. I want to be the one that leads them out and scores all the goals for them and takes them up. I want that. And I just love yeah. that about him. I love how honest he is and yeah. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And um, I, you mentioned uh, Tavernier there and um, he's someone that kind of intrigues me as well, Jordan, because um, he's he's always struck me as someone that's got the raw uh, physical minerals to be a really successful attacking player. Uh, and he's been around for a few years now and you know he's got that direct running ability. He's got a bit of upper body strength as well, a bit of pace in there. But it feels like he's got another level to go up. And I'm just wondering, like, if you think he could have a, a big season this year? A thousand percent. I completely agree with you, Gabriel. I think, well, I f we first seen him um, on the scene, it was under Gary Monk. And I think his debut mm -hmm. was actually in the time we had Derby against Sunderland. The tease we had Derby, yeah. sorry. Um, and yeah, we played Sunderland and he scored in that game which was not only amazing for us, because obviously can't stand Sunderland, um, but for him as well to get his first goal for the club. And kind of since that moment, you know, he's just one of them players where if he's not in the team, you really feel his presence like being missed. Um, and, you know, I, I think okay. if it wasn't for a couple of injuries last season, he would have finished better. Um, but like you say, he's definitely got another level to go up. And I think if mm. he stays injury free, I mean, Warnock released, um, uh, you know, some comments the other the other day, stating that 
he didn't actually want to take Tav to Fulham. The only reason that he took him was because Tav was in his ear, you know, saying, no, I've been training, I'm fine, I'm feeling OK. Um, when really he should have been out for another week or so. So he's a little bit cheeky when it comes to stuff like that. But I know it's because he wants to play every game. Um, yeah. But I think if he can stay fit and, you know, without a doubt, his first name on that team sheet for me, I think he'll definitely have a big, big season. And I think if he does have a big season this year, which I think he will, if we don't go up, it's going to be very hard to keep him very hard yeah. next season. Very hard because depending on what happens next season, whether Warnock stays or, you know, you just don't know with his age and things of bringing in a new sporting director, whether we go down, you know, a similar route to what Norwich did, bringing someone like Daniel Farker. Mm. Um, I think the likes of him and Dale Fry, they're going to be two players that will really struggle to keep hold of next season. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, be really as a, as a sort of more of a broader EFL Championship follower. Um, I'm really excited to see how he gets. Yeah, definitely. I think, like you say, he's got he's got loads to offer. So, fingers crossed, he can give us some exciting moments. Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Well, uh, like I say, uh, anything else that you you want to ask or anything? About that that Fulham game, I think, or with, uh, I think it was a great point. I think it's just um, it's going to be really interesting to see now how Middles will build on it because it's probably going to bring uh, a different type of task. I think probably next week against Bristol City, that's a game that uh, you're probably going to be under a bit more expectation to win. Probably a similar story uh, for the trip to Derby later this month and at home to, to Backburn Rovers. So um, I think different types of tests uh, to come. Where, but I think that's a great point because it means that if you if you do win a couple of those games that I've just mentioned and maybe get something against the QPR, then you're going to be in a good position in the table. So um, I think that's a great start and I can't wait to see how you get on for the rest of this month. Yeah, fingers crossed there. Eh? I know, um, like you say, when you look back at some of his, his sides that he's won promotion with, one of the things they've always done well is got off to a good start and kind of stayed mm. consistent from that. So I think, yeah. like you say, that point there, brilliant point. Now if we can go ahead, get the three against Bristol City, that straight away puts in a really good position. Um, mm. And I think we've sold something like 23, 24,000 tickets already for Saturday's game. So I think there's some, there's only like 8,000 oh, tickets brilliant. left. So we're we're all on about where yeah it's going to be amazing. Oh, the atmosphere is going hmm. brilliant. So I think if the fans oh, can all get behind, I tell you what, I'm going to. Yeah, I'm going to my team's first home game of the season next Saturday, and I absolutely can't wait. That sense of football coming back and going to your ground and um, eating a eating a burger on the way and smelling the grass and <laughs> saying hello to people like that's that's what football is all about, mate. And um, it's so that's it's an absolute gift and. I'm uh, I'm so glad that we can all experience that. Yeah, I mean that's why that's why, like I do our MFC, and I'm sure that's why, you know, you do your EFL show. I think mm. it's one of them things where football's just like within you, and it's it like it is. It's in your blood, and when you get the opportunity to talk about it, it like to be fair, we've known each other what five minutes. Do you know what I mean? We we don't really know much about each other. But we share this love and this passion for football, the sport, and like our clubs. Um, yeah, definitely. And like you said, that is it's what football is all about. You know, being able to share these memories and you're just just a feeling, isn't it? And it's all about you know getting up early to get on a bus to go to the somewhere you've never been before with all the lads. Or yeah. you know, up up here we have um, what you call a parmo. I don't know if you know what a parmo is. I've I've heard of a parmo. It's like it's like a combination of lots of meals in one, <laughs> lots of takeaways in one. Oh, you honestly, if you if you make the away day to to uh, the riverside, I will take you to get a, a, a good palm or take your Manjaro's place in in Middlesbrough called Manjaro's. Amazing. Yeah. To be fair, if it's a night game, so I can't remember our fixture, but there's a burger van. 
outside our stadium, right, and at a night game, always swore by it, a Palmo in a bun and a Bovril. Do you know what a Bovril is? I know, well, I'm from Birmingham, so yeah. I, I think, I know, I know of a Bovril, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but a Palmo is essentially, it, it's like, it's like chicken breast uh, in breadcrumbs, right, like obviously fried breadcrumbs, um, in with bechamel sauce, right, and loads of cheese on the top. Very interesting. I'm a, I'm actually a vegetarian, um, oh, so, no so I'm not sure that was quite right for me. But I did want to try, um, and this was a long time ago. I tried this uh, veggie burger at this chip shop in Derby, and it was you put it in the fryer. And it was probably one of the best veggie burgers I've ever tasted. I've not been anywhere that puts a veggie burger in the fryer since then, which is probably a good thing for, for me. <laughs> else, but um, but that, that, that's probably one of the best takeaway things I've had. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go then. Uh, that's what I mean. You've got to try these things, don't you? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> got to be adventurous. Have to live yeah, life on the but, edge. <laughs> like you said, this is what football does to you, you see. You go to these different grounds, you try different foods. It's all about. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's the whole reason I go to any grinds, really. <laughs> yeah, I try. Uh, I love the pies. Pies all over. Like mm. you say, the different... I, I feel like it's food. quite a... Without stereotyping too much, I feel like pie is uh, quite a northern thing. Like, I've never understood chips and gravy. Um, I don't, Do you have chips and gravy? Oh, my word, yes. Oh, I, I, the thing is, I like dry chips. That, that's my thing. So I feel like I'd rather dip chips into something, but I wouldn't want sauce on the chips because it makes them all soggy. So I'd much rather just like have some chips and some mayonnaise. I can't really get the, the gravy. Really? Oh. Yeah, I, I don't like the idea of chips and gravy. Have you tried it, though? I haven't tried it, no. Honestly, give it a try. See what you think. You might not like it. You might not. But I think if you give it a try, it, it's honestly, it's absolutely gorgeous. You you won't regret that decision. Okay. <laughs> loads of um, loads of salt and vinegar as well. Oh my word, you make me hungry. <laughs> but no, I didn't realize. I can't believe we're talking about food. <laughs> Why are we talking about food? <laughs> Don't know. Um, but no. I didn't realise pies were just a, a northern thing. I thought I thought that a few stadiums down further a little bit down south was Yeah, I, I think like so you go to places like uh, like Morecambe and that you know, you go to I think it's generally places up north that kind of specialise in pies. They're not like obviously pies exist up and down the country, but I feel like the north get their pies pretty spot on, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, we do good pies. Worthy mm. pies. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> right, well, um, that, that pretty much sums everything up, I think, Gabriel. I think we've covered all bases, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, I mean, we, we went from... We went <laughs> Middlesbrough, Tavernier, yeah. Pies, Parmes, yeah, you know. Just, it's all in there, lot. it's all in there. We started off with the review, then we talked about transfers, and then straight on to food, and teaching Perfect. what a Parmo is. It's been a, it's been a good little uh, little review. Sounds good to me, yeah. Brilliant. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on, mate. And you know, like I say, we'll do more stuff like this throughout the season, hopefully, and kind of yeah, I'd love that, mate. With you and some other fans from different clubs or whatever. Um, and yeah, that'd be brilliant. 